All right. Well, maybe we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, Jennifer is going to introduce this. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Roberta, for joining us. Um, and thanks to everyone on the call. Um, welcome to the Healthy Beverage Policies. Starts the new year off right. My name is Jennifer Gross, and I work in the Health Policy and Planning Division of the San Mateo County Health System. And I provide support to Get Healthy San Mateo County. Next slide, please. Get Healthy San Mateo County works collaboratively with individuals, communities, and organizations in San Mateo County to develop strategies that will reduce and prevent obesity and other health risks related to unhealthy eating and a lack of physical activity among all kids in the county. We focus on places where residents work and play. Reducing the consumption of sugary drinks is one of several Get Healthy San Mateo County strategies. This webinar is a follow-up to a convening we held a few months back that was attended by over 50 elected officials and community members. In addition to my work with Get Healthy San Mateo County, I participate in the Bay Area Nutrition and Physical Activity Collaborative, um, or the BAMPAC Leadership Council, and decided that we should open up this webinar to our allies outside of the county. Next slide, please. OK. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Roberta Friedman. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity. And we're here in uh, snowy New Haven. Uh, but I hear it's kind of cold out in California these days. Um, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing today and then give, your, give you an overview of what's going on uh, at the Rudd Center as well. And I want to thank Jennifer and San Mateo County for inviting us to uh, participate in this webinar. It's, it's great to talk to all of you. And I should say, too, I'm a, I was a California resident for 20 years. But I'm an East Coaster, so I'm back home. Um, so today what I want to go over, and I'm going to leave time at the end for questions and answers, is give you uh, just an overview on why we're targeting sugar-sweetened beverages, um, some information on taxes and on other policy options, and we'll have resources at the end, and Jennifer will um, uh, participate in that as well. And then we'll go to questions and answers. So if you're not familiar with the Rudd Center, I, I uh, circled our uh, website at the end. And we do what we call strategic science here at the center. I'm um, one of the few public policy people. The rest of us are researchers. And you can see this bulleted list of the kinds of research that we're working on. And what, the reason we call it strategic science is that what we're trying to do is answer uh, sticky policy questions. And so the research that we do is meant to be turned into findings that um, elected and unelected officials can, and appointed officials can use to write really powerful policies that will change environments and hopefully reduce obesity. So I want to start out on uh, the talk about sugar sweetened beverage to, beverages today by just reminding you of what we're talking about. Because most people, I think, uh, still think instantly of soda. But the universe of sugar-sweetened beverages is quite large, and it's growing. And when we uh, talk about reducing consumption, we're talking about the teas and the energy drinks and vitamin waters and sports drinks. And that blue stuff up in the right-hand corner of your screen is some kind of fruit drink. Um, and so what, when we talk about uh, reducing consumption, we're usually talking about all these kinds of products, not um, not diet drinks, and not 100% fruit juice, both of which have their problems. And if anybody's got questions about it at the end, we can talk a little bit more about that. And just to give you an idea, um, our economist on staff estimated that adults in the United States are drinking about 46 gallons of sugar-sweetened beverages a year, which is quite a bit. Um, and so it leads into why should we be targeting sugar-sweetened beverages. And I've got a list here, and I'll explain some of them in more detail. So the first is because they are made up mostly of added sugar, which are empty calories. Uh, we have rock-solid proof of harm. We've got scientific evidence that's very, very solid at this point and um, is a good reason for us to target sugar-sweetened beverages. And I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. 
Um, it's also poor calorie compensation, which I'll also explain, and the relentless marketing. So I'm going to go through these a little bit and give you some um, additional information about them. But before that, I just wanted to say that I translated the 46 gallons of ye a year into some, some uh, numbers for you. So a 12, there's 12 calories in an ounce of a sugar-sweetened beverage, that, and the 46 gallons uh, adds up to about 5,800 ounces a year, about 70,000 calories, close to 71,000 calories, and that's about 4,700 teaspoons of sugar, which when you think of it that way is, is pretty difficult to swallow. And I wanted to show you this video because this is one of the ways that um, New York City has dealt, uh, has been advertising how we deal with that number of calories. So um, I thought that was a pretty powerful video. And New York City shares a lot of their information and a lot of their educational materials, so you might be able to borrow some of what they've done. So I also wanted to show you um, uh, in terms of the kinds of supersizing that's happening now. A 64-ounce uh, double gulp is, is um, about 780 calories and 54 teaspoons of sugar. And when you think about um, something like this, you know, these, these kinds of double gulps don't come with two straws. They're not meant to share with anybody. And so it's an inordinate amount of sugar that people are consuming. This, on the other end, is a more reasonable um, limit on a portion size. It's a 16-ounce cup. and um, if you've been keeping up on this at all, you'll know that in New York City, uh, Mayor Bloomberg's uh, Board of Health just passed an ordinance that would limit the portion sizes down to 16 ounces in the uh, food establishments that's, that are regulated by the Board of Health. And even the 16 ounces is still 13 teaspoons of sugar. It's a heck of a lot, but it's better than 54 teaspoons of sugar. So I wanted to show you a little bit more in terms of added sugar. This is NHANES data from uh, for two-year-olds and older, and you can see that we uh, about 48% of the calories that we consume of the of the of the uh, foods that we consume are from beverages, and that's where our source of added sugar comes from, about 48%. And I broke it down a little bit more for you. Um, you can see that sodas are the single largest source of added sugars in our diets. So it's quite a bit. And why do we have to worry about this? Um, it's because they're empty calories. And this is the definition that um, uh, the USDA put in, and I, I pulled out the, the key words for you. Um, empty calories, they add, you know, these are foods that add calories, but few or no nutrients. So they're basically, there's not much good in these, um, in these beverages. They're not adding anything substantial or important to our diets. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of consumption on health, and this is where the uh, rock-solid um, proof of harm comes in. We have got an enormous number of studies at this point that are showing that overweight and obesity um, is one of the impacts of the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages, and this is on children and youth and adults. Type 2 diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease in adolescents and adults, and it's, I think it's particularly worrisome to know that uh, adolescents now are beginning to have cardiovascular issues come up. They're way too young. Uh, dental caries and erosion and um, increased calorie intake and a poor overall diet. 
And um, if you are interested in the in these studies, we synopsize them on our website, and I'll show you the website again at the end uh, so you can find out where these are. But there are uh, articles and studies and commentaries coming out almost on a monthly basis, and most of them, I would say 99% of them are showing that there is a, a negative impact on health from consumption. Uh, it's interesting to note that the ones that don't show a correlation between consumption and negative health impacts are the ones that are funded by the beverage industry. So um, why increased calorie intake? What is the mechanism that's, that's causing us to turn these calories into weight? And it's uh, the best that we can make, with, make out with this is that um, sugar in liquid form is less filling than um, in solid form. So we don't end up compensating for the extra calories that we drink by, you know, eating, a few, eating fewer calories, reducing the size of our meal because we're having a soda with it or, um, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So that, that, that seems to be the mechanism that's causing the weight control, the weight uh, problem. And um, I, would, I would say raise your hands if you don't recognize this, this uh, ad, this marketing piece, but I can't see you, of course. But um, one of the problems with, and the reason to target sugar-sweetened beverages is because the relentless marketing, especially to kids, and we're doing a lot of work on this. So this is the Coca-Cola polar bears. You know, they're cute and they're cuddly. And um, they brand the, the name very well. And uh, most of the time, you don't even need to see the Coke bottle to know that it's Coca-Cola. We did, uh, in the past year, we did a large study on sugary drinks and marketing of them to children. And um, just a few things from this. You can find this on sugarydrinkfacts.org. And despite the industry's promises uh, to stop marketing these beverages to children, what we found is that from 2008 to, to 2010, children's and teens' exposure to full-calorie sodas on TV, uh, those ads doubled. And these companies are specifically targeting black and Hispanic children and teens. And the beverage companies spent about $948 million in 2010 to advertise their sugary drinks and their energy drinks um, in measured media. This was an increase of 5% uh, since 2008. And measured media just means that tr those traditional forms of media such as TV and newspapers and magazines and, and radio and things like that. But they are branching out into all the social media networks now so that they're is much cheaper and viral in many cases. And they're advertising on, um, on the web and they're sending text messages to children. And um, so they're, they are using all the social media, Facebook as well, to keep um, the, the brand going. So um, I put together this chart just to point out um, the, the similarities between tobacco and sugar-sweetened beverages. And tobacco taxes was certainly one of the major public health initiatives uh, um, of the century. And I just wanted to show you that, you know, in some ways we can check off almost all these same boxes, that, that sugar-sweetened beverages are also a public health menace. They're definitely unnecessary for survival. As I just said, they're marketed heavily to children and also to adults. Um, they contribute, the consumption contributes to diseases that are driving up health care costs. Uh, we don't know about addictiveness with sugar-sweetened beverages, but uh, there's got to be a reason that they gratuitously add caffeine to a lot of sodas, for instance. Um, you know, when blind taste tests were done, uh, to see if people could recognize that there, you know, that there was um, caffeine in a soda, because the beverage companies will say that they add it because of taste. People couldn't tell the difference between a caffeinated and a non-caffeinated beverage. Um, and the industry is definitely looking for young consumers. And you know, I just I threw in this slide to show you about the impact of taxes on cigarettes. You can see that you know, as the price of cigarettes climbs, consumption goes down. And that's the same kind of thing that we're looking for, especially with sugar-sweetened beverage taxes. 
So um, our economist, Tatiana Andreeva on staff, did um, a study on the impact, it was a meta-analysis on the impact of food prices on consumption. And this was one of the first ones done in the country. And here's what she found, that a 10% increase in the price of a sugar-sweetened beverage would uh, result in a 10 to 12% decrease in consumption. So in other words, uh, sugar-sweetened beverages are what's called price elastic. Um, price inelastic um, products are those that people will buy no matter how much the price goes up because they consider them absolutely essential, like milk and meat and eggs and things like that. But sugar-sweetened beverages are, in, are uh, price elastic. And um, a one cent per ounce, which is what we've been recommending in terms of a tax, is about a 20% increase. And there was a, a new study uh, by Lisa Powell out in um, Illinois uh, that reaffirmed that, in fact, sugar-sweetened beverages are price elastic and that a 20% increase in the price would reduce consumption by about 24%. And so here's our tax proposal. As I said, a penny per ounce on any beverage with added caloric sweetener. Um, we are looking for an excise tax, not a sales tax. And this is because excise tax is what we're assuming is that the, uh, the, the excise tax is levied on the, either the bottler or the manufacturer. And what we're hoping is that they will automatically price, um, pass the price increase on to the retailers who will then put a more expensive um, product on the shelf. Whereas with a sales tax, people don't know that they've been taxed until, unless after they paid for it and they take a look at their cash register receipt and they see that sodas have been taxed, they don't know, they don't notice it as much. So we believe that an excise tax would be um, much more productive. And we are hoping, and we have seen this in a lot of the tax revenue, uh, the, a lot of the tax legislation that's been filed so far, that the revenue would be earmarked for obesity prevention or for other um, issues like, um, you know, subsidizing uh, the, the uh, buying of fresh fruits and vegetables for low-income people, things like that, as long as it's about increasing nutrition. And what we've seen in polls that have been done in various states that have been um, considering soda taxes or sugar-sweetened beverage taxes is that if you ask people, you know, do you support a tax on sugar-sweetened beverages, you'll get, a, you know, sometimes a little bit below 50% support. But if you say, would you support the tax if you earmark the revenue for obesity prevention, and particularly for childhood obesity prevention, the support goes way up into the 70s very often. And we've got those polls on our um, website as well. So a few other effects of a tax, it would obviously raise considerable funds for prevention and we have a revenue calculator on our website and I pulled the numbers for California. If we were to do a penny per ounce tax in 2013, the state would raise $1.1 $1 billion, which is significant. Um, it would, we think, <coughs> influence demand for healthy alter healthier alternatives. And um, I want to give you a little bit more about um, what it would do in terms of um, health care costs and uh, benefits in terms of a, of a tax. And this is a study from uh, Claire Wang, who's at Columbia University. And I'm going to read you a couple of the statistics. From 2010 to 2020, a tax would prevent 2.4 million diabetes persons' years. 95,000 coronary heart events, 8,000 strokes, 26,000 premature deaths, while avoiding more than $17 billion in medical care costs, of those health care costs that are related to obesity. So very significant. Um, we, we don't know for sure about reducing weight. Um, we did get a study recently, there's a study done from Illinois that's, that uh, calculated that a nine, they would get a 9.3% reduction in obese youth and a 5.2% and reduction in obese adults with a penny balance. Um, there was a nutty, another study that just came out, again, by Lisa Powell, and their results about, the, um, about reducing weight with a tax were uncertain, but that was because, probably because uh, they only had sales taxes um, in, the state, in the country to take a look at, and those taxes themselves were relatively low.
in terms of the impact of the tax, just to sort of recap this, um, health would be improved cons because consumption would go down, medical care costs would go down, and uh, we're not so sure about weight, but we are assuming that it would have an impact on uh, weight. And in general, um, one of the wonderful things that we can say for sure about the impact of a tax, and this is information um, that I got from Jeff Ritterman in Richmond, uh, who you know you probably all know just did a tax. I did a, um, I interviewed him after afterwards, and he said that one of the best parts about this, even though the tax didn't pass in Richmond, was that it spurred discussion in communities about sugar sweetened beverages. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was beginning to see the information about um, the harm that com that consuming sugar sweetened beverages does and getting, you know, learning more about it and knowing that it was not a good thing. He said to me that um, somebody even came up at one of the rallies that he was at and said to him, you know, I'm against sugar sweetened beverage taxes, but boy, I don't touch this stuff anymore. So it was very interesting to see how it's had, um, it's, it's really been an incentive to local organizations and uh, different groups excuse me, to, um, to take a look at organizational policies and things that they can do other than a tax to reduce consumption. So um, if you consider doing this in your town or your county, um, I wanted to alert you to some of the things that the industry will uh, come up with. And um, they will make a lot of statements, and only two of them are actually true. Um, they will say many things drive obesity. This has been, they, they have said these things in uh, all the hearings that we know about, and in fact, they recited these in a hearing out in California several years ago, which I know you can still take a look at on, the, on a website. I can get that website for you if you're interested. They'll say that many things drive obesity. That's absolutely true. We've never said uh, sugar-sweetened beverages are the only things that drive obesity. They'll say it won't solve the obesity problem, and we ha also have not said have a significant impact on health issues. They will say that consumption is down, but obesity is up. And the place that that is true is that actual consumption of sodas themselves is down, but of energy drinks, sports drinks, vitamin waters um, in particular, Consumption is up, and they are uh, their market share of those kinds of beverages is actually going up. So it's not not quite true to say that consumption is down. They'll say that sugar isn't special; all calories are equal. Um, and here's an, another place where I remember in the California hearings from several years ago, one of the senators who was on the panel um, after the the uh, beverage industry said this. She said, "Are you telling me that?" that the calories that you get from broccoli are equally as nutritious as the calories that you get from a soda? And of course, the person couldn't quite answer that. Um, they will say it's all about physical activity. Um, and there are plenty of studies that have been done in the past several years that, it's, that say that really uh, sugar, the, the, the increase in weight is not about physical activity as much as it at, as it is about the increase in calories. They'll say the science isn't clear, but um, I've given you some information on that and can get you more on it if you're interested. They'll say that people will lose jobs. I'm, I might have put a false slash question mark there. Uh, we know that there's a study being done that we're hoping will come out soon on this. But uh, what we do is look back to the experience of um, tobacco taxes where the tobacco industry said we're going to lose jobs all over the place, and it just was not true with tobacco taxes. So we are assuming it won't be true with sugar-sweetened beverage taxes. And that's mostly because we're still going to need uh, the bottlers, we're still going to need the truck drivers, we're still going to need those retailers to be selling um, other beverages as well. And so uh, we don't believe that this is a true argument. And uh, they also talk about um, the tax as regressive, that it would hurt the poor. And it is true that uh, poor people spend, uh, spend a larger percentage of their income on, um, on groceries, but um, these, the, the kinds of um, diseases that afflict uh, lower income people are also regressive. And 
um, you know, more lower income people are, are afflicted with diabetes, more lower income people are overweight or obese. And so we believe that ultimately um, a tax will uh, help everyone in the end. So the industry's defense, they will also talk about the nanny state argument. They'll say that this is absolutely mm -hmm. something that should not be dealt with by the government, that it's a government intrusion. But I can think of a lot of public health issues that the government stepped in, <clears throat> excuse me, such as on tobacco and on seat belts and, um, you know, we look to the government to make sure that our food is um, uh, health, uh, is uh, safe, things like that. And um, the government has the, the, the authority and the, the um, mandate to step in when we are facing a crisis. And we are absolutely facing a crisis with uh, obesity rates. They'll also talk about it being a bad personal decision. What they are not paying attention to there is that um, we have to look at the environments that we live in um, and that we can talk till we're blue in the face about how important it is. People might make poor decisions on their own, but we really need to take a look at the environments that we live in. And when um, you think, for instance, about children, if we say, you know, they, should, they shouldn't be drinking sugary beverages and shouldn't be wanting them, we have to look at the environment in which the uh, sugar sweetened beverage industry is really marketing heavily to them. And marketing is very powerful. So we have to take a look at our environments and not blame this on individuals. Um, they will say you can't compare it to tobacco, but you could refer back. If you hear this from them, you can refer back to that chart that I just showed you. And they will say that uh, they are definitely part of the solution. And the problem with, and in fact, uh, my next, no, it's not my next slide. I'll, go, I'll show you something in, in a minute that uh, the industry just came out with as being part of the solution. Um, the problem with saying that they're part of the solution is that um, Basically, bottom line is they are corporations and they have to answer to their shareholders and their mandate is to um, keep raising money and raising more and more money. So they have to sell more and more of these beverages. So it's um, difficult to believe that they can really be part of the solution when they are marketing and selling these um, empty calorie sugary drinks. So a little bit more about what to expect if you decided to take on a sugar sweetened beverage tax. This is what to expect from the industry. They will increase their philanthropy. I'm sure that you have seen in your own communities um, some of the uh, Coke rewards and um, um, Pepsi had a, a, a big um, philanthropic initiative going to, you know, fund uh, um, gardens and schools and they give money to different organizations and they want to show that they're being good corporate citizens. If you get to the place where, to the, the point where you have a hearing, they will pack the hearing with industry people. Um, they spend millions in lobbying and uh, they'll do more ads as part of the solution. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and they will create these community coalitions against beverage taxes. And I'm going to show you an example of that. But first, this is a very recent um, campaign that they just launched just the other, uh, yesterday, it looks like, actually, the 15th, um, about talking about all of the low-calorie beverages that they're making now and that they're fighting this new battle on, on obesity. But one of uh, um, the beverage, uh, a consultant to the beverage industry actually said that these ads are not going to make people choose healthier drinks. He said, the, and I quote, the ads are great, they can be entertaining and informative, but essentially they don't change the nature of consumption. Um, he also said that this is not about the uh, industry selling low calorie products, it's about them being seen as, as good guys in this fight. So you need to take a look at these things and, and know some of the facts about what they're doing. And this slide is um, the, perhaps you've seen this, this is the uh, front group that the industry set up to fight the tax in Richmond. They go into practically every community that we have seen sugar sweetened beverage taxes be introduced in, and they set up these coalitions, they call them community coalitions, but if you take a look at the membership, it's every major sugar sweetened beverage company, as well as their trade organizations like the American Beverage Association. 
So I want to talk a little bit now about policy options, and um, I'm, I know I'm racing through this a little bit, but I want to leave some time for questions at the end. And so there are a lot of really um, interesting policy uh, initiatives that are being instituted all over the country. Um, one of them, you know, again, as you probably know about New York City, they're going from super size to human size, and they have passed this reasonable portion limit. It's due to be in, um, implemented or and in um, March, but right now the uh, beverage industry has sued New York City. Um, and uh, they are going before the judge, I think it's on January 23rd, so we'll hear about what happens with that. But apparently New York City feels like it's very much in, within their authority to have done this through the Board of Health. So this is one of the, one of the other kinds of policies that, that is being looked at. And some other cities, you know, once New York City does it, because they're so huge and they're such leaders, a lot of other cities across the country um, follow. And I just wanted to show you this. I got this from a presentation that New York City did. They found this um, <clears throat> old ad from Coca-Cola. A 16 ounce, which is now what they are proposing to take the limit down to as a, as a more reasonable limit. Coca-Cola themselves used to say serves you know, 16 ounces used to serve three people. So um, pro portion sizing is just out of control in this country. Um, there are a lot of city and county procurement policies that have been passed. The, one of the ones that was the earliest one is Mayor Menino in Boston uh, decided that no city money would be used to buy sugar-sweetened beverages on city property. And I know a lot of um, cities and counties out in California are either, either have done this already or are considering it. And um, this is related because it's nutrition standards for what can be sold in city and county uh, vending machines and at city county events. And you can see California is definitely a leader on this. Um, this is a slide from our um, set of slides on all of the different beverage campaigns. And I'll give you the uh, web address of that at the end when we go to resources. So other kinds of policies, there are some really wonderful hospital initiatives happening around the country. Healthcare Without Harm has been spearheading this initiative, and um, they're, getting the, they're getting hospitals and other healthcare institutions to sign, to sign on to pledges that say that they are not going to sell sugar-sweetened beverages on their property. Um, and some of these are, you know, taking it even, even further, uh, you know, past the pledge and really implementing it and changing their food systems, which um, to me makes absolutely perfect sense. It's so rational and logical that a healthcare system would not sell a beverage that has nothing to do with health. Um, water in schools is picking up a lot of um, energy. I know there's been a lot of things done in uh, California on this issue. And uh, we're hoping to see more of this across the country. Part of uh, the mandate of the uh, Healthy Hunger Free uh, Kids Act, which changed some of the regulations on, um, what, on uh, nutrition in schools, included that uh, language about having water be available and accessible during um, mealtime in public schools around the country. Um, Potter the Otter is another initiative, and I don't know as much about this, so I'm, Jennifer, I'm going to ask you to talk about it at the end, if you would, and I think it's on one of the slides from Banpack. Um, we are also looking to uh, reduce the amount of marketing of sugar-sweetened beverages as well as other foods that are, are low in nutrition and, empty cal and high in empty calories in schools. And these are just three examples of the way that they're marketed. There are um, a lot of schools that have gotten rid of their sugar-sweetened beverages, but a lot of them still, if they have beverage machines, the, the picture on the upper left you can see, you know, that, that's marketing right there. Um, having a vending machine in a school that's got a Coca-Cola sign on it. And Co Coke and others of the um, uh, industry, uh, of the companies are still doing contracts with schools where they say, we'll give you X amount of money as long as you will put our logo up on your scoreboard or have um, our logo in different places around the school. And you can see also on the bottom, um, My Coke Rewards has, is donating to schools. So this is just three of the few uh, ways that um, 
uh, sodas are being marketed in schools. And we here at the Rudd Center just hired a director of advocacy resources for marketing. And she is working to um, uh, light a fire under parents and advocates across the country to work on marketing to kids, including in schools. Um, and uh, so if you are interested in getting in touch with her and finding out what she's doing, if this is an issue that you are interested in and want to pursue, I can give you her name um, at the end. Well, her name is Carol Hayes, and she's on our website. And um, I'll give you the website again at the end. Uh, this is a very interesting program. I haven't checked in with them lately, so I'm not sure what's happening with it, but Boston pediatricians were getting together and starting to write prescriptions for their patients to say, stop drinking sugar-sweetened beverages. And I think, you know, everybody knows that it can be powerful to have your doctor write you out a prescription saying something. Um, and so this is an interesting way to go about it. It might be something that you want to consider uh, approaching hospitals or, or your pediatric association out in California to think about doing. We are seeing um, more churches. These are three churches in Seattle uh, that have done this, but more churches signing on to healthy beverage initiatives and, and pledging not to serve sugar-sweetened beverages to their parishioners. Um, we also, this is a little bit of a difficult one, but there are some communities across the country that have tried to, to get uh, the fast food restaurants to change what's in their default meal and also to stop marketing, um, you know, in their marketing showing that they are just giving uh, um, milk and apple fries with their Happy Meals or their kids' meals, but then when a parent or a child walks up and says, I want a Happy Meal, by default they serve them uh, the French fries, the large size French fries and a Coca-Cola or, or whatever other beverage, whatever, whatever other sugar-sweetened beverage. So um, there are some communities, I, maybe some of you know about this, I, I thought that I just heard recently that El Paso, Texas was working on defaults. Um, I couldn't find anything else about it, and I can't remember who told me, but um, maybe if one of you know at the end when we have questions and answers, you can let me know if you know about their initiative. Um, there are a group of people uh, across the country working on supermarket initiatives, which is a difficult one to do because the profit margin in supermarkets is so low, and a lot of the supermarkets um, uh, sign on to these lucrative cooperative marketing agreements with the sugar sweetened beverage um, companies. But we're trying to talk to them about beginning to change what's on their end caps, those at the, at the end of aisles, um, their floor displays, um, setting, you know, trying to get them to think about not setting up uh, sugar sweetened beverages right at the checkout aisles or in coolers, or at least replacing them with the lower or no calorie beverages. Um, to limit some of their discounts, to think about charging higher slotting fees for the full sugar beverages. And those are, slotting fees are what um, they pay to, uh, what the beverage industry pays to the supermarkets to have their, their most popular, highest selling beverages be right at adult eye level. Um, we're talking to them about doing fewer promotions and about possibly putting up some health information on the aisles uh, the sugar sweetened beverage aisles to talk about how many calories are in them, how many teaspoons of sugar. Um, this is this is very early work, and um, uh, if you're interested, I can get you connected with the folks that are doing this. Um, but we'll see, and we'll see what comes of it. It might be promising. So I'm going to stop with the information there, but just give you a few more things on resources so that you've got some uh, websites to go to. But we're going to start, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer so she can talk about um, San Mateo and what resources she has. So hold on just a sec. Okay, so Jennifer? Great, Roberta, thank you. Um, Get Healthy San Mateo County is working on reducing consumption of sugary drinks in a couple of different ways. We are working with three cities and about five nonprofits to write and implement wellness policies. And these nonprofits are eligible for implementation incentives. Um, if your organization or your city is interested in this opportunity, please let me know um, as we might have some additional money to provide support to other cities or organizations. We're also supporting organizations um, to write or adapt vending machine or healthy meeting and similar policies. 
please visit our website um, where we have a page devoted to workplace wellness. And, um, and as we have a number of different sample policies and other information. Uh, next slide, please. And Get Healthy Cemetery County is also encouraging our community partners to, to participate in Rethink Your Drink. Uh, the goal of this is to increase awareness about the effects of unhealthy beverages and to promote drinking water. We have a number of different materials, such as posters, flyers, um, books, uh, specifically Potter the Otter book that Roberta mentioned, which is really focusing on uh, the younger population. I think it's K to 5. Um, Please uh, also visit our website um, on uh, the specific to sugary drinks um, to learn a little bit more um, about this topic, to learn about upcoming events and trainings, and other ways that you can take action in your community. Uh, next slide, please. Bandpack's website also has a number of resources. They have toolkits, uh, information about an upcoming quarterly meeting in February related to sugary drinks and promoting water, um, as well as sample ballot policies. Uh, next slide. And I'm happy to discuss ways that you can get involved with uh, Rethink Your Drink and wellness policies and other policies. Um, so please feel free to contact me um, at that email address. And I also have a number of materials um, that are available. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. And um, so I wanted to give you our website. And if you're on our home page, if you scroll down about halfway on the uh, left-hand side, there's a link to resources on sugar-sweetened beverages and taxes. And um, uh, you'll find a whole range of things on there. There's, we've got a legislation database, and we put together maps of all of the states and, and uh, cities and counties that have filed tax legislation. We uh, have synopses, as I mentioned before, of all of the major and current um, uh, studies that have been done on a whole range of things, including adult uh, health risks and childhood obesity um, in relation to sugar-sweetened beverages and how taxes work and things like that. Um, and if you go to our additional resources page, the um, lower uh, arrow is pointing to the public health campaigns that I was talking about before, that whole range of different ones that have been done. And we've got, these, we've got a set of slides, the Healthy Beverage Campaign slides, which you can see at the bottom of this one, and also a list. And it links, it, we, what we do is give you links to um, the website of those different yeah. campaigns so that if you want to get in touch with them, if you're interested in one that they're doing in particular and you want to you know, get some ideas from them, you can go to <coughs> those websites as well. And this is, um, this is not yet on our website, but I'm giving you a teaser. Um, what we're going to do is put up a website pretty soon. It should be ready by next week, we hope, which uh, will show all of the initiatives in all of the states that are doing anything that we know about. The, the uh, yellow states are ones that have some kind of initiative going. California happens to be in orange because I, when I took the screenshot of this, um, when you when you put your mouse over California, it um, turns orange. And um, what it does then is if you click on the state, it will link to a list of all of the different initiatives that are going on, taxes, pledges, policy changes, um, educational campaigns, all of those kinds of things so you can see that resource. So take a look, you know, be on, be on the lookout for this within um, a week or two. Um, we also have just, uh, last September, we updated our policy brief with uh, some of the latest uh, studies and science on sugar-sweetened beverages. We've also got in that brief a list of um, arguments pro and con on the issue, and uh, which could be helpful for you if you're considering the sugar-sweetened beverage taxes. And I wanted to point out out in California, kick the can, that. Um, Harold Goldstein's group, California Center for Public Health Advocacy, has put together Kick the Can, which is a wonderful resource on all different kinds of um, tools that advocates on this issue can use. So I hope you'll take a look at that as well if you haven't already. And um, I wanted to thank you very much for, to Jennifer especially for um, having us do this. This is my, um, you can see my email and phone number. I want to um, 
just reinforce, please feel free to call me or email me if you have questions. Um, I would also be happy to send you the slides that um, we showed today, and I can help you put together a PowerPoint if you need to present to your, your communities, your organizations. You could ask me to do it. I would be happy to do that for any other organizations as well, but I'm happy also to send you those slides. And I wanted to especially thank and Andrea Wilson, who is sitting here in the office with me today. She's our communications manager, and she helped us put together this webinar. So uh, we're going to move to questions and answers now. Is it everybody? So you, uh, you should be able to just speak up and ask a question at this point. I'm going to go ahead and ask a question. Um, this is Jen, and uh, I just wanted to ask you um, about one challenge that we've been facing with uh, some of the cities that we're working with. And um, we basically have heard that there's one particular city, um, or and there probably are others that have sheriff associations, and these are essentially separate entities. So as we're working on developing wellness policies, they're often not falling under the purview of the policy. And I'm wondering if you have any recommendations about how we might be able to work with these sheriff associations that um, are often raising money through vending machine sales. Yeah, that's a, an, an interesting problem. And I would say at this point my best answer would be is um, if you can find one or two allies within the association, there's bound to be someone who uh, would be interested in sugar sweetened beverages and get them to at least allow you to do a presentation on the the upsides and downsides of consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. I, you know, I know the money is often very um, enticing, and it seems like uh, you know they're raising considerable funds by allowing the beverages to be sold in their organizations. But um, you know, we've been fighting on this level with. Um, a lot of school systems who don't want to get rid of the junk in their vending machines because they're making money off of it. And so it, it won't be an easy battle, but I think if you, you know, can start with uh, working with, find one or two allies somehow within the organization, or maybe some of your, um, the other organizations who work with them know somebody that they might be able to talk to. Does, has anybody else on the call, have, have you had this um, issue come up and do you have a, an even better answer? Thanks for your Hi. Reply. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is Jenny Jones from Shasta County, and um, I work for Shasta County Public Health, and uh, we're working with different organizations um, with their vending machines and trying to reduce the number of sugar sweetened beverages in the vending machines. So um, my challenge has been trying to find those healthy alternative beverages, but um, that was actually going to be one of my questions because I've um, made several phone calls and emails and I'm having a really difficult time finding the actual names of brands um, of healthy beverages. Um, and I didn't know if, Roberta, you had any recommendations, but I don't know if, if that could be a potential thing for um, your, your sheriff's association, um, if they were going to, if they could possibly work on, you know, swapping out those unhealthier beverages in those vending machines so that, you know, f at least 50% of the vending options are healthy options. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, ha I have um, an absolutely wonderful resource which, which we just helped to develop. Um, I, I don't know the website, so may, maybe Andrea does Howard County. What's it? Is it? Is it that? So if you do, if you go to Howard County Unsweetened dot org, um, this is a Howard County, Maryland initiative. Uh, they are trying to reduce consumption in the whole uh, county, and we just help them create a better beverage finder. And you can go to it and plug in the parameters, you know, do you want low calorie, do you want sodas, do you want sports drinks, and come up with a list of um, uh, all the different kinds of beverages that would fit a really good strict definition of healthy. 
So it's howardcountyunsweetened.org. Great. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Other questions? Well, I was going to say, this is Susan Carlins from Bandpack, and we find that many of the organizations we work with are also looking for healthy vending lists. Um, and we are starting to use the Howard County resource, so thank you. Oh, good. Some, sometimes they just also just want a written list to know that there's a lot of things available. I mean, and it's not always that easy to actually get your vendor of uh, these kinds of drinks to carry all of those uh, alternatives. But I'm actually trying to do a paper list because um, there, there just isn't one around. Even we're using the public 100% healthy beverage standards. Um, and they don't have a list of drinks that you know, so we're, we're working on that. Great. Thank you. And can I ask where you're from? Uh, BANPAC, the Bay Area Nutrition and Physical Activity Collaborative. That's www.banpac.org. So we'll have the list up there with a lot of uh, uh, comments about how the uh, ingredients change frequently and so on. But Here's an idea, here's some ideas to get going. So uh, she showed that uh, she showed our our homepage. I think Jennifer did earlier. It's uh, www.bandpack.org, and we also have a healthy beverage uh, toolkit, helping you develop a healthy beverage policy for your agency. Great, thank you. Other questions or comments? All right. Well, I guess we'll leave it there. Um, I hope you will, again, feel free to contact either Jennifer or me and if, you, if other questions come up. And, uh, you know, feel free to ask for more resources or if you want a, a webinar done. But, you, you know, you've, you're some of the leaders out there, so you certainly have a lot of wonderful resources out there as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. And um, stay warm, I hope.